Good morning, everyone. Merry Christmas to those of you who are here and watching online. It is great to welcome you this morning. It is great to be together. It is great to know that this is a new day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and we will be glad in it, regardless of what's going on, regardless of the chaos that may be around us sometimes. It is the Lord's day, and it is good to be together, to worship Him, to be reminded of His sovereignty, of His goodness, of His care for us and to lift his name on high together. And so we thank you so much for being here. We do want you to know that we have canceled life groups up until, uh, I believe, January 17th, just as precautions. And just keep checking our social media, and we'll get that out there, and we'll give updates uh, just kind of as the times go by. But as you know, everything can fluctuate kind of week to week. But that is the plan just as we have it right now. And so we still are planning on having a Christmas Eve service at 530. Uh, again, Keep looking out for social media stuff. If things kind of tick up one way or the other, we might adjust that as well. Um, but right now, that is our plan. So, again, welcome, and would you join me as we pray this morning? Father, I thank you so much for this day. Thank you it truly is the day that you have made. Thank you that you have made each one of us in your image, and that you care for us, that you love us, that you are sovereign, that you continue to work all things together for the good of those who love you were called according to your purpose. God, in our hearts, we know that there are many who are wrestling with many different things this morning. God, I know just in following friends that there are those who are struggling with so many different health issues and health-related issues and family issues, job issues, friendship issues. God, there's just so much going on. Just in these moments, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and remind us of who you are. God, as we are your church, we are your people, we desire to honor you, we desire to live in obedience to you, and so God, we would pray that you would allow our faith to be strong and courageous, and that our faith in you would not waver simply because things around us do. And so, Father, for all those who are part of this church and this congregation, for those who are simply friends and family, we do pray that you would answer each and every concern and burden and heart, that you would bring healing, that you would bring hope, that you would bring forgiveness, that you would bring peace. And more than anything, that for all of us in every situation that we find ourselves, that we would honor you and that we would trust you fully. So wherever you have us, God, we are your people. And so I do again, I praise you for this day. And as we sit under the teaching of your word, would you speak powerfully through Pastor Don and open our hearts to your message. God, as we observe the Lord's Supper, would you be magnified and glorified. And so we just thank you again, God, for this day, for every person who is here, for those who are watching online, for being the creator of all things. Bless this service as we simply honor you. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. And lighting a candle is a simple yet profound act. It's a testimony to the power of light over darkness. As we light this fourth candle of Advent, we continue our journey to Christmas. The fourth candle of Advent is called the love candle. As we anticipate Christmas, let us remember our loving Savior how he came once as a baby, that the world through him might be saved, and how he will return one day in glory. The words of Zephaniah, Zephaniah 317, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. How do we know that Jesus came in love and demonstrates love? If you will, read with me Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And as we rejoice in um, this Christmas season, will you please stand with us as we sing, O Come All Ye Faithful.
It might be a new song to you, but it's just a hymn, so it does the same um, verse over and over, but the words are so beautiful, and I hope you'll take them to heart um, because they talk about the beginning when Jesus was born, how he came, how he died, and how he rose again, and how he's coming back again. Amen. people said, Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Is everybody okay? Doing all right? Good. I guess you are. It is good to be with you on this Sunday before Christmas. It's here. And um, I'm just thankful to be able to be here with you. Take your Bibles, if you would, and open them to the book of Hebrews. Now, let me remind you of something. We're going to have a church conference um, at the end of our service, and so I would encourage all of our members to stay. It won't be long. We just need to vote on the budget, 
And so, um, but we'll just um, take about a 30 second break after the service and then we'll gather back here and make sure we are able to take care of business. And the reason I'm saying that is because we want to have a quorum, all right? So stay, <laughs> so stay with us. So, um, everybody's kind of staying home in the midst of all of this. And we've had to, felt like it was wise for us to back off of our life groups for a little bit. Um, during this holiday time with so much going on and we see this rise in cases, we just want to make sure that we do the right thing. Hebrews chapter 10. Um, you probably saw in the news this week about the Faison family. Uh, James and his wife, Face, James Faison and his wife live in um, a subdivision called Mulberry Park, and it's on the north side of Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, so this year, they um, they put up their Christmas decorations, but their Christmas decorations were a little bit different. Um, they put up a six-foot cross in their yard, um, and then they decorated it, or they, they put some... Christmas ribbon, and they put Christmas lights on it, but um, you would have thought that would have been all right, but the Homeowners Association sent them uh, a notice of violation and said they had to take the cross down because the, the Homeowners Association had no idea how a cross could be considered Christmas decoration, and um, now, I, unless you think that this is some anti-Christian strong-arm tactic by the HOA. That's not necessarily, that's not what this was. Let me just read some of their response. They said the cross is appropriate for display during the Easter season, but not as a decoration during the Christmas season. And unless biblical references can be provided, noting the cross as a symbol of the Christmas season for the board to reconsider, the cross is not considered to be a Christmas decoration. And so a local news station got wind of that, and they contacted the HOA, and that's when the HOA said that the cross could stay up for the time being, but the matter was still under consideration. Now, listen to me this morning. I'm not trying to bash the HOA at all. I mean, I, I, I get where they're coming from. Um, but honestly, when I read that, I didn't know whether to laugh or whether to cry. Um, because intentionally or unintentionally, a lot of times during Christmas, we tend to forget about the cross because we're so focused on the baby. Or it may be that we tend to forget about the cross because we just and I don't want this to come out wrong, but we just like the joy of the Christmas season, and um, we just want to focus on that. You know, it's like Easter is Easter, and Christmas is Christmas. Um, but we can't compartmentalize our faith like that. I mean, as simple as this may sound, we can't leave Jesus in the manger. Um, it reminded me of something Adrian Rogers once said, he said that if we're not careful, our carnality can lead us to make more of his birth than we do of his death. And, and that's the reason that when we have Christmas time, that's the reason we have the Lord's Supper. Um, because it helps us remember. And one of the best times to be reminded to remember is when we're tempted to forget. And so that's why I want us to look at this passage today as we move toward the Lord's Supper. If you would stand with me, let me read these verses out of Hebrews chapter 10. And the author says, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then, would they not have ceased to be offered? 
for the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. And it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. But then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. And he takes away the first that he may establish the second. A new covenant. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. If you will, let's pray together this morning. Father, I thank you so much for being able to be here with these folks. And Lord, we know these are unusual times and we're separated by six feet or more. Maybe we're separated by being at home and and watching online. But Father, I pray that in our heart we would be unified. And Father, I pray that what I say today um, somehow will be a reminder for us. And Lord, I know that it may even sound like what I say all the time, but Father, my heart is to glorify you. Our heart is to glorify you and to be right before you and to hear from you. So today, please, just speak to us, remind us, and be glorified as we've gathered and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now in your Bible, verses 5 to 7 probably are in italics or they're They have quote marks around them. Um, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. And then I said, here I am to do your will, O God. That is is a reference. It's taken from Psalm 40. That's why it's in italics like that. It goes back. It's a quote from Psalm 40. Jesus knew that he was entering the world to be the once for all sacrifice for sin. There was never any question as to why he was coming. And and we know that. That's why the angel told Joseph that he would call him Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. So in essence, we understand that Jesus was born crucified. Right? Bethlehem and Calvary go together, the cradle and the cross. One isn't going to make sense without the other. Because if we only celebrate his birth without remembering why he came and what he came to do in the first place, then, then we're going to miss the whole point of Christmas. So I want to give you a Christmas verse this morning. That is 1 Timothy 1.15. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Christ Jesus came into the world, and that's what we celebrate at Christmas, Christ coming into the world to save sinners. He became flesh to save us from our sin. He emptied himself to save sinners. He was birthed and laid in a manger so that he could save sinners. I want to tell you, one day I was, um, I'm going to get this chair, that's all right. One day I was um, looking at the um, crucifixion story in order to just see if I could put together a little more of the crucifixion 
and the incarnation. And, and as I read that crucifixion story, there was one or three words that really stuck out to me. And, and they were these. It's when Jesus was on the cross and he cried out, it is finished. It is finished. Right? And then I began to wonder, well, he's crying that out, but it doesn't say to whom. And I thought, well, was he saying it to the Father that he had finished the work that God had sent him to do? That's what he said in John 17 in that, in that prayer. Or, or was it a cry so that Satan would hear to let him know that the battle was over and that Jesus had won? Or was he saying it for himself that the Son of Man had been obedient and faithful to accomplish the will of the Father? Was it a fulfillment of what um, verse 11 says, that um, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied? What the law could not do, Jesus did. What was begun at the manger was finished at the cross. It is finished. Now, there are some people who have this false notion that what happened was that God had this plan for the people and He unveiled it to Moses and all of the people of the Old Testament, but then somewhere along the way something went wrong. Right? And God recognized there was a problem this sacrificial system isn't working, and so he came up with another plan the, to correct everything. But the Bible is clear that the cross was God's plan all along. It was not plan B. Before the world was ever created, God knew that the old system wasn't going to cut it. And in his mind, way back when, he knew Jesus would have to come and die. And even in Psalm 40, you go to Psalm 40 and it's laid out. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. Now, the writer of Hebrews wants to make sure that we understand that and that the law was just a shadow of what was to come. See, the Old Testament system was a, really, it was a constant reminder of their sin that it was not totally removed. I mean, they knew that. You could tell that because just as soon as they were finished, they knew this was going to have to happen again. And it was going to have to happen again. It was going to have to happen the next year and the next year and the next year, on and on and on. And that's what verse 2 says. It makes that argument that if their sins and their consciences were truly clean, then why in the world do you do it again? It reminded me, I, it reminded me of what Dwayne Thomas, the running back for the Cowboys, said one time about the Super Bowl. He said, if this is the greatest game ever played, why do we do it every year? Right? And, and it's the same thing for those people every year. It was a reminder that they needed something permanent, that what they were doing was going to have to be done again. And it put a longing for something permanent, something more effective than the blood of bulls and goats. And so that sacrifice became an annual reminder of their sin. And everybody who participated in it understood four things out of that, and I'm sure more. But one, they were sinners in need of forgiveness. Something had to be done about their sin. They, they recognized that. That's why they had that sacrifice. Number two, there would have to be atonement made for their sin. Number three, that atonement would require the death of a third party. And then number four, it would require the shedding of blood. Now you go ahead about 800 years and you read what a prophet named Isaiah said telling the people what was going to happen and what God was going to provide. He said He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to His own way, but the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. And you read that and you begin to think, wait a minute, that sounds like one day God is going to send a person to be the ultimate sacrifice. No more animals. There will be someone to make atonement for the sins of all of us, once for all, a human lamb of sacrifice, if you will. You go, well, how can that be? 
This is what God was planning. And then you look at verse 7 here, and you see what it says. Then I said, Behold, I come, and the volume of the book is written of me, to do your will. To do your will, O God. Now you think about that Old Testament sacrifice. Right? The animal had no concept of what was going on. It was placed on that altar against its will. But the sacrifice that the Lord made for us was voluntary. It was in full awareness and in complete submission to the Father's plan. Nobody took his life. He gave it willingly. Freely, lovingly, sacrificially, Christ gave his life, shed his blood for us. Well, he said, no man takes my life from me, but I give it freely. You can take that thought and what it says here in verse 7, that he came to do God's will, and you can overlay that on the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, not my will, but thy will be done, Father. In verse 10, by the will, by that will, we have been sanctified. By its very nature, Christ's work of atonement is unrepeatable. It was a once-for-all event. It is finished. Through his death on the cross, we've been forgiven of our sins. Through the death and resurrection, we have been ransomed. We have been restored. We have been regenerated. And we are received forever into the family of God as we respond to him in faith. So, All of that is to say, whether the HOA approves it or not, you cannot separate the cradle from the cross. Now, let me give you three very, very, very quick takeaways that, as I began to think about this, about it, I thought, what, what, how, how do we, how does that apply to us beyond the, the, the obvious application of, if we have not received Christ, we need to open our hearts and receive Him. We need to surrender our lives to Christ because there is no other. But let me give you these. Number one, never let the familiar become ritual. Why did God say, why does the Scripture say that God was not pleased with that? Well, one of the reasons is because it was nothing more than a ritual for those people. I mean, they would, they'd worship Baal during the week. They'd do whatever, and then they'd roll in and offer those sacrifices. But there was no sincerity. There was no genuineness of spirit. They took something that should have been a symbol of real faith, and they turned it into a ritual where there was no faith. And you remember what David said in Psalm 51? He said, um, you do not desire sacrifice, or I'd give it, Lord. You don't delight in bur- offering. But then he says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart of God thou will not despise. It's like he's saying, Lord, what you wanted all along was our heart. But we just kept giving you ritual. And I really did begin to think about that in our Christmas celebrations. We don't let it become ritual. We love the Christmas songs and the secular Christmas songs, and we, we love the season. We love everything about it. But sometimes, if we're not careful, we can get so enamored with the tree and everything else that we just give lip service to Christ. And it becomes a ritual. We must never let it become ritual. Number two, always celebrate Christmas in the light of a bigger picture. Always celebrate Christmas in the light of a bigger picture. Why is Christmas special? Always celebrate it in light of the bigger picture. And number three, the true spirit of Christmas will show itself in a heart of obedience. You understand that? That's that's the Christ spirit of Christmas. I have come to do your will, O God. Christmas is a celebration of obedience. 
Christ came to do the will of the Father. So when we think about Christmas, it doesn't just teach us about love. It teaches us about obedience. So when we come to the table, or when we don't have a table and we do what we do, we come to remember. We stop to connect the cradle and the cross. And we remember that the eternal, resurrected Son of God took on flesh, dwelt among us, and died in our place so that through his shed blood we can find redemption and forgiveness of our sin. So when we partake of these elements, it's really our personal testimony of what Jesus has done for us and that we have received him, as John says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe on his name. As we have received Christ and, and surrendered our lives to follow him, this is a testimony of that. So I invite all who are um, followers of Christ, born-again followers of Christ, to participate today. And again, we because of um, the situation that's going on, we have changed everything around, and there are the elements on the table in the back. Hopefully, you were able to pick those up as you came in. Um, we invite you to get one if you did not so that you can participate, but I want to just lead us in a word of prayer before we do anything else. So would you just bow with me? I want to ask if you would just to take a moment um, and let's just examine ourselves. Maybe, maybe there's something that you know you're harboring in your heart. Maybe it's a wrong attitude. Maybe it's a lack of faith in an area that you know God is at work, but just you can't really see that. And maybe you're holding on to a grudge rather than forgiving, or maybe you've lost your peace in the middle of everything that's going on. Or maybe it's just that you're tempted to forget what this whole season is about. And I'd ask you to take a moment and confess that to God and ask Him to wash you clean of that, to give you the right focus. Father, today, hear our hearts. We know that you see who we really are. You see our thoughts and our intents. And we pray, Lord, that we would seek to have that spirit of Christ Spirit of Christmas, coming to do your will, of simply doing your will. So we look to you, Lord, today and ask for cleansing as we thank you for what Christ has done. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Now again, this is um, very different, um, but I would ask you to take your elements and if you could open up the bread. And if anybody needs help, um, there should be somebody around that would that would help you. Open that up. 
I want to read this again. Um, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. And then I said, Behold, I have come, and in the volume of the book it's written of me, I have come to do your will, O God. The one who was born that night, laid in a manger, the eternal God, the holy, pure, sinless Son of God on whom our sins and our iniquities was laid, said to his disciples, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, the disciples took the cup and gave it. We have our cup with us. And I would ask you to very carefully open the juice. The angel spoke to Joseph and said, she will have a son will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He'll save his people from their sins. And in chapter 9, just before this, in Hebrews 9, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So the child in the manger is also the suffering one of the cross. Jesus, the crucified one, and this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As I said last week, it is the most amazing thing when you think about what has been done for us, the price that has been paid, and we need to remember, we must never let things become ritual. We must celebrate Christmas in the light of a bigger picture and understand that the whole spirit of Christmas is an act of humility and an act of obedience on the part of our Lord. And may we choose to live our lives and to be like him in all things. Amen? Amen. Give me just one second. Today, maybe you've been... Um, you're with us or you're watching online and, and you want to know more about what it means to trust Christ, I encourage you to, if you're here today, talk to House or to me, or you can, there's a form, you can go to our website at um, scbcga.org, and on that website, there'll be a response link that you can click on and then just tell us what... Uh, questions you may have or whether you have made a decision for Christ. And uh, we'll get back with you. We'll pray for you, pray with you, encourage you, and share with you next steps according to what the Word of God says. But it is good to be able to gather together and to remember. And we must never take that for granted. Never take it for granted. And so what I want us to do is we're going to um, have a word of prayer and be dismissed, but I encourage all members, if you could, to stay so that we can just respond to this 
2021 budget. So take a minute. Um, there may be somebody that you don't know, a guest here or somebody that's not a, a guest, but you just don't know them. We'll introduce yourself to them. But after a minute or two, we'll come back together and we'll, um, and we'll meet and take care of this church conference. Okay. Susan? Is that okay? Okay. All right. Well, then let's stand and pray. Lord, we love you and thank you. I pray and thank you so much for everyone that's here. For your heart, um, Lord, toward all of us. And today as we um, go about and move toward Christmas, may we never lose sight of what it's all about. We love you and we praise you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.